kena ki te taura i te taura. E tipu nei rā hoki ko ngā pū, ko ngā wau, ko ngā kā, ko ngā wau wau, tā rewa tū te rangi. E ke paruku, e ke tangaroa, haumi e, hui e, tā aiki e. A te ko mihi tuatahi a ki tō tātau, kei hau tū, a i ngā kupu tuku iho ki te wāhingaru. Nō reira tēnā koe e te rangatira, nau nei i tuwhera te kupu i te kōrero mō tātau i raro te tuanui o tāne. I raro hoki te tuanui o te whare nei e tū nei, nei ki te hoa rangatira o tō tātau whae te neipo. Nō reira tēnā koto. Tēnā hoki kōtau e te haukai, kōtau Ngāti Whātua. Tēnā kōtau, kōtau nei te kaipupuri tētahi wahana o te mauri nei o roto o tāmaki makaura. Tēnā hoki kōtau e ngā iwi o te motu e noho nei kōtau i roto o tāmaki makaura. He mihi kawatana kia kōtau. Tēnā kōtau e tahi o kōtau i haramai i tawhiti nui i rono wakia nau i haramai kōtau i roto o manga kito, manga kino no reira tēnā kōtau. Tēnā hoki kōtau e ngā hoa nei a koe ama e ngā taranaki kōtau nei te nei whānau hoki kei wānui o kōtau a tia tia o taranaki no reira tēnā kōtau, tēnā kōtau katoa. Mea miharo tēne me te ahua a wana wana mataku ki te tū ki konei ki moa i te tini me te mano ki te tuku ki e tahi whakaaro, he whakaaro noahe. Tērā tākuna hīkoe, te ahua tana o te hīkoe, a te koe iwi a nai tūhoe, i roto i ngā rautau. He mōhi ana e tahi kōtau i tēne hīkoe, te iwi o Waikato, a nā me ki nā iwi katoa huri noa te moti nō reira. Kōtau e ngā rangatira nō reira, tēnā kōtau, tēnā kōtau, tēnā tātau katoa. This is my mountain. O manga pōhatu tēnei e tūnei. This is ōhine mataroa, ko te tipu awa tēnei. This is mā marai, ko te rewa rewa pai, te rewa rewa pā, te mā hure hure hapu. This is ruatoki, where I was raised. Some of you would have been there. Ruatuki sit in the valley at the mouth of the Uruwera, a native forest in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand. It is the ancestral home of my people, Nai Tūhoi. We are also known as Nā Tamariki or Te Kohu, uh, or the Children of the Mist. I am honoured to be here to talk to you here tonight as part of the Reeves Memorial Lecture. I must say I was a little surprised to be invited to speak, to speak at such a flash event <laughs> for the leadership of New Zealand, especially with my long history of upsetting <laughs> the leadership of New Zealand. Here I am, here you are, but it's all good. Ne. So standing here in this building, it is hard to acknowledge the wairua of the man that surrounds us, surrounds us and brought us here together tonight, especially since the building we are sitting in his name after Sir Paul Reeves, Te Rangatira. This is his mountain, Taranaki. This is one of his rivers, the way you were Nana. 
This is his marae. Muru raupatu. Puke tapu hapu. Which is part of Taranaki. Taranaki iwi jatiawa. Sir Paul Rees Whakapapa. To these places and these people through his mother, Bihemana. Equally important to us in his connection to his Pākeha, Whakapapa, through his father, Dasi. You see, Whakapapa is not just about looking into the past to see who our ancestors are or what waka they came in on. Whaka Papa is a genealogical GBS. It helped to locate us and give us context. It's acknowledged the source, the beginning, and it gave us insight into our journey and an understanding of our potential. Like the potential of a boy bullied at school for being brown, brown. the of a driver who go on, goes on to be the Anglican Archbishop of New Zealand, the first Māori Governor General. And here we are sitting in the building named after him, listening to a lecture named in his honour. Sir Paul Reeves was a child of two cultures who spent much of his life searching for the common ground between them. He honoured both Tikana Māori and Tikana Pākehā. And through this, he earned the respect of both cultures. It is a testament of his mana. Now, this word mana. Mana is a very important word in our language, in our real. You may have heard it before. In fact, everyone in this room, in here, has some form of mana. Your mana comes from knowing who you are, where you come from, and your connection to Papa Tuanduku, to the land. Mana grounds you. Mana makes you solid. Mana roots you to your past, present, and future. We don't always have to agree. Mana can be tested, even challenged. But with respect and understanding of one another's mana, we are all equal. We are on the same level. We call this kanohi, kanohi, kite kanohi, eye to eye. When it comes to Māori issues, it could be said that Sir Paul and I were in different sides to the same coin. It's thoughtful, considered mediation of two cultures to my more <laughs> theatrical, <laughs> confronting approach. But such was our whakapapa and the rain that fell on our mountain took different journeys to reach the sea. As a boy, I was raised by my grandparents and spoke only Māori, like almost every, everyone there, Rātoki. School was a, a very confusing time for me. It didn't make any sense. The rules and regulations didn't make sense. The history they were teaching didn't make sense. When I was eight, 
the whole school was called to the assembly and the principal got up and said, I will not allow you to speak Māori on my school grounds. Well, if you continue to speak Māori, you will remain after school and be punished. Well, believe it or not, even at the age of eight, I was a bit of a stirrer. Me and my mates wanted to test, test the headmaster's manner. So we disobeyed him and spoke Māori to see what would happen. Well, we're given the choice of picking up horse manure or writing, I will not speak Māori a hundred times on the blackboard. I must have written those lines a thousand times and picked up a tons of horse manure. <laughs> but I did learn English. But you know when you learn a new language and you pick up all the swear words first? <laughs> well, that was us. At home, I was thought about my ancestors, my mountain my river, why these things are important to the mana of Tuvoi. But at school, I was told, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle. The cow jump over the moon. <laughs> the real Māori comes from the sound of the birds. I speak the same language as the tui, with the kiwi, so I wonder, would the, the headmaster stop the birds from speaking the language too? Recently, I spoke at a conference for middle school teachers and principals and told them this story because this principal had a profound effect on the view of leadership and authority. And I wonder... What, what impact they would have on young Māori of today? So I asked them. If you could go back and be my headmaster, my headmaster back then, and if you had the chance to call that assembly, what would you say to these children? Would you and the headmaster, are they going to be free of fear? So they can question, speak out, and analyze. I may ask the people in this room a similar question. Does your leadership rely on you having authority? Or does it rely on you having respect and understanding of someone's manner? As a boy, there was a gap between what I was taught and what I learned. I was taught, hey, diddle, diddle. But what I learned was, don't be afraid to challenge someone trying to assert authority over you. Just because someone has authority does not mean they have more mana. If someone is asserting their authority, they have to let go of respect and understanding to get their way. You are no longer equal. At 16, I moved to Christchurch. It was another kind of education to discover what's actually happening in the rest of the world. People were questioning authority, women's liberation, anti-apartheid movement, the anti-Vietnam War, socialism and the rights of the working class. I started to hear stories from other culture that sound like the old two-way stories. Stories about stolen land, 
community displaced, stories about police brutality, story about military rule. I started to meet new people, Māori and Pākehā, taking a stand against these things. It inspired me. These were not just Māori issues. They were global issues with global movements. Around this time is when we started the Christchurch chapter of Nga Tamotua Tuatoru. We wanted to confront the social racism that we as Māori were being exposed to everyday racism towards Māori are pretty, pretty hardcore back in those days. We were branded as towel makers, delinquents, which was probably true in my, in my case. So we couldn't get flats, we wouldn't get served at restaurants, we would get harassed and beaten up by the police. So we were not the only ones. This was also when the police were carrying out the dawn raids on the Pacific Island community here in Tamaki Makoto, which gave rise to the Polynesian Panther movements. So we started feeling like we didn't belong here. People were treating us like foreigners on their own land. So what does a two ways? So where does a two-way go when he need help in a foreign country? So he goes down to the Maori embassy, of course. <laughs> but there was none. So what does a two-way do when there is no Maori embassy to go to for help? He borrowed his dad's tent and make one, of course. And by this time, I learned the art of protest and political activism and, in, and occupied the space so they cannot avoid you. Draw attention to the issues and make them uncomfortable. Make them face you and make your voice be heard. If mana can be tested, then you may have to defend it. No one can tell you that you are not important and that what you experience does not matter. And if you do, I'll challenge them to say it to your face where they can see your eyes ne? and feel your breath. I to I. You had to keep the pressure on. Keep reminding people of the things they would rather forget. We had to constantly remind the crown that we are here and we were not going away that we needed to have a proper conversation about the stuff that had gone down with our tipuna, our ancestors. 1850, what Tuhoe knew as was actually much bigger than what it is today. In fact, over a million acres. For generations, we live under the mana motu hake or Tuhoe. We govern ourselves, Using tikana and kawa, we were free. We managed everything that we would have had to provide. After years of war, Chuwe had peace and maintained good relationship with their neighbour, even sharing parts of the Uwera with other Iwi. We traded with Pākehā, and adopt things that we found useful, like tools, crops, weapons, and even religion. 
but two who always remain an unbreakable connection with the Uduwera. A connection that started with the rain that filled the lakes in their mountain, flowed down the river, the Awa, the stream, all the way to the sea. However, what followed over the next 150 years was a systematic undermining of the vulnerable to haki of Chuhue through government policy and law. In 1865, the Crown used the law and school shirt policy to confiscate the land that connects us to the sea. This confiscation land line would have been a profound effect on Chuhue people and their future. I remember when the Crown went around the country to talk about the particular envelope. This was the government offering a limit to the settlement of historical grievances. Before they even heard of my claims, or any claims, so I decided to make an offer for the return of your land. My nephew, horse blanket, Oi Kahukiwa, Kahukura. And when I arrived, this is what I saw. The crown sitting on the stage looking down at us. We were not eye to eye. We are not on the same level. So what does a short ass to her do when he's been talked down to? He bought a ladder. Whakateka. That grain listened to my submission. I think he had a migraine that day. This is Doug Graham taking my blankets. Four years later, here's the horse blanket hanging in the office of the treaty settlements. They had taken my blankets, framed it, hung it on the wall as a piece of art. They had my blanket, but they still had the land. So four years later, what does a two-way do when someone steals his horse blanket? <laughs> he sent an invoice. <laughs> it's a pretty big one, too. <laughs> in fact, I said about three of them. So it wasn't really because I wanted the money. Not at all. I wanted to remind the Crown that until this was resolved, they still had a debt to Tuhoi, and we were not going away. Just like this. And this. This is the Māori language petition, 1972. Hannah Jackson. Here we, here we were trying to convince the Crown that the Māori language was not dead and that it should be taught in New Zealand schools. The Māori landmarks, 1975, Fitna Kupa. This march was not just about taking Māori land grievances to Parliament, but also to show Māori that united they had a voice. Taka Parapa, Bastion Point, 1978, Nati Fatua. In this occupation, Joe Hook and Nati Fatua had to convince the Crown and the property developers that greed was wrong. That Springbok Tour, 1981. And he were here we were trying to convince the government, rugby in New Zealand, and a few thousand police, that racism was wrong, that everyone has a right, 
or everyone has rights as a human. Anti-nuclear campaign 1985. As a nation, we convince America and the world that we choose our own destiny. These are some of the political and social movements that have shaped the identity of this country. Not just because they had political opposition at that time, but because after the eye-to-eye contact, contact was the realization that the manner of the people is equal to that of any authority. I'm a mother, Papa Papa, Kitai Nui Waikato. The river is the mighty Waikato. It's at about 425 kilometers. It's the longest river here in Aotearoa. The river comes from Lake Taupo, from the mountain A. Ice of the Mauna Tongariro me Ruapehu. Much of Tainui Mana is tied to this river, and they have this Koriro, this problem. Waikato Tadifara, Hepiko Hetanifa, Hepiko Hetanifa. For every being of the river, there is Arangatira and the story. And so after the many beans in the river and the many tanifa, we started the process of restoration between the people of Chuhue and the representative of the crown. To start this, the process we needed to tell our story to the Waitangi Tribunal in 2005. They were invited to Ruatuki to listen to those stories. We'll guess who they put in charge of the welcome. Me. A short ass to a short ass to way with play for the theatrical. The two way executive, executive committee were getting a bit nervous because I would not tell them what we were going to do. So I told him, trust me. It was not until that morning that everything was revealed. So we wanted this to be more just another, to be more than just another intellectual fact-finding exercise. But they were going to be, uh, they were going to be on Yamarai, a kanohi ki te kanohi. We wanted to be all of their senses to life so that the story of hurt, mummy, pain, anger could be experienced and felt by the tribunal, not just recorded. This was 160 years of being told that we were not important, that as experience did not matter. It was time for them to see our eyes and feel their breath. So the idea was simple, create a theatrical reenactment of the Crown invasion of 1865. So we stopped the tribunal's cars about a kilometre from the two-way confiscation line. We got them to climb aboard a horse-drawn cart, which is symbolic of the settlers' uh, period. So a hundred horsemen escorted the cart down the main road towards the confiscation line where myself and 102 were, were waiting to make the challenge. So we had lined the road with overturned cars and set them on fire. So you could feel the heat coming off them and taste the thick black smoke everywhere. And we were firing the gunshot into the air. It was awesome. 
But man, it was intense. So it was so intense that later that afternoon, Judge Savage told us that some of the tribunal members actually feared for their lives. It was then explained to Judge Savage that. So it was for 2 way 1865. As usual, the media missed the point completely. They reduced our uh, theater to just another piece of resistance. It probably didn't help that only eight months before our reenactment, these were the images of Māori that were everywhere. The four shore, seabed hikoi. So to the, to the untrained eyes, when they look at like things that had escalated and the country worst fear had come to, Thousands of natives had marched on the capital. They had started their own political party called the Māori Party. And now Tamiji was taking government hostage, burning cars, carrying a shotgun, and shooting the flag. Holy shit. <laughs> This guy to be a war and Tamiti is the general. He wanted to take over the government and kill all the white people. Tamiti is like the Obama, Bin Laden, two way are all Al Qaeda. <laughs> they must be the terrorists. <laughs> Ignorance is the oppressor. Vigilant is the liberator. Know your enemy and choose your destiny. Was I the enemy? Some Pākehā thought I was. Some Māori thought I was. Regardless what you think of me, who you believe, or what you believe, what we were doing in the Uruwera. 2007, October, 15 raids showed us with, showed us was that without vigilance, history can repeat itself. And what Tu Hoi was experiencing, yet again, was a leadership that relied on its authority, not in the respect and understanding of our mana. During my time in prison, I came to understand what it must be like for my tipuna to be forced into a way of life they did not choose. I must say, it was an adjustment to be living with convicted murderers, rapists, wannabe gangsters, but I had to keep my mind and way to active and use the time constructively and positively. So I threw out my TV out the door, listened to Radio New Zealand, and work on my art. I also moved to the Māori Focus Units, to Omara, my Waikiri prison. Here I was a co martyr and a mentor for the other prisoners. So in this, in this unit, we practiced chikana and kawa, this created a structure that I was very comfortable with and the framework which enabled us to live together with mana. We wanted to keep the reason issues of the raids and incarceration separate from the current settlement negotiation. 
Two who were determined to push on and get a historical agreement that include the return of the Uruwera. And all decisions were made at the Fano level and flow, flow through the Hapu and out to the Ibi representative. E hoki ki o bauna, e hoki ki o awa, ki o kohatu, hei puna kōrero. Go to your mountains, go down to the river and find the stone that has the knowledge. So after 170 years of struggle, we finally got respect and understanding from the Crown, we got this. The Crown unreservedly apologises for not having honoured its obligations to Tuhoi under Te Tiriti o Waitangi and profoundly regrets its failure to appropriately acknowledge and respect Te Mana Motahaki o Tuhoi for many generations. Do you see, history has woven us together. We are the basket, the kete, the kete that holds the future. So it is important that the true lesson of history of any nation are learned, not just taught. We must acknowledge each other in this space. Kanohi kite kanohi, eye to eye. Ko maunga po hatu te bauna, ko hine mataroa te awa, ko tūhoe te iwi, ko taura e nga raurangatira, i are are mai nei ugo ko tautarina ki e nei kupu kore rohiti, no reira, tēnā kotou, tēnā kotou, kia rahui hui tātai katoa.